Will democracy survive the next couple of years? And essentially, we are the same. Can't have government choosing winners or losers. There are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is life illuminated and Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan. Acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians, a Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome back to Access to Democracy. I'm Holly Jenkins, your guest host, and I'm so happy to be here today and welcome a return guest and a phenomenal leader for District 51A, State Rep Sandy Mason. Hello, Holly. Thank you for coming My today pleasure. to talk with us. Um, running for re-election, um, you've been here yes. a few times, and we're wishing you all the best on November 6th. Thank you. But I want to ask, uh, recent sessions that you've been involved in have become rather challenging for the Democrat side in particular. Um, it seems as though the sense of cooperation has has eroded, and now we've we find ourselves in just some pretty hypertensive partisanship. And although most people would agree that the polarization, the polarized culture that you've been working in is not benefiting us, it's not helping Minnesota move forward, um, yet it stays. So when you are back in session next, next year, next spring, what can we do to bring this back to a compromise? How, what are some examples of issues you've worked on where you really have had some success or not success? How can we get it back to a compromise and eliminate some of this um, polarization? Uh, well, one thing... It shouldn't be a problem, right? <laughs> one hopes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've been encouraging people over the past year or so is actually to be, you know, when, in addition to writing to their own representative, is to also contact the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader in the Senate, and the Governor. Because the way things are uh, ending up the last few terms, that's those three have the most power at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do want to say that many people think that uh, my co colleagues and I are not talking on the floor, and that's, that's not true. I mean, we do talk, uh, but there are bills this year that I guess I was incredibly disappointed that didn't pass. Like, mm -hmm. for one thing, the, uh, an increased rage, uh, raise for the home health care workers. Mm -hmm. That's an industry in crisis. It affects everybody throughout the state, mm -hmm. and yet the Speaker did not schedule that bill for the uh, vote on the House floor. Mm -hmm. That, to me, was uh, terribly disappointing. And in that case, you know, obviously, his caucus has more influence in getting the bills Mm -hmm. to the floor than the minority does. Right. Uh, the other one would be like the uh, hands-free driving. Right. And I mean, we know that no matter who talks t to me about whatever their first issue is, the second issue is usually their concern mm -hmm. about seeing somebody with a cell phone in their hand on the freeway. So this is really important. And again, right. that didn't make it to the floor. And that was an vote. example I wanted to bring up. That's a clear example that was in the in the papers and the media and the public and both sides supported it, yet it it just hit a dead end. Um, so moving that forward to, to break down some of that uh, partisanship and the, or the, um, yeah, the stronghold that partisanship seems to have taken over as a new culture. And do you see some hope for that improving? Um, what What's it going to take? I think, and I have been saying this for the last year, we need more grassroots 
uh, influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need people coming to the Capitol or at yeah. least contacting everybody to mm -hmm. let them know that they are watching closely. Yeah. Uh, so that's important. One of the things that we did do this year that was really encouraging, uh, after Gabby Giffords was shot at the University of Arizona, they started a, a program on disc, you know, uh, civil discourse. Mm -hmm. And so I know I've gone to that as well as a number of my other colleagues. So this year, uh, we did have us uh, start our own group mm -hmm. on uh, civil discourse. So it, we would be like, we'd have a lunch for anybody that wanted to come, both senators and House members, okay. uh, down in the Capitol. Uh, we would, and when we're sitting around the table, again, we'd introduce ourselves, and we talk about non you know, your name and maybe one non-political thing. Mm -hmm. But on the walls we had uh, sheets of paper with questions where people could put their comments on. So okay. I just want people to know that we really are working to uh, encourage more Wonderful. discourse between all of our members. Well, thank you. Well, I hope that continues and maybe we've seen the worst of it and it's going to get better yeah. from here. We'll stay optimistic. Um, you know, you mentioned that bringing people back, uh, back into the discussion, having folks become engaged and follow along and call the call their representatives. Um, it's it's very challenging in so many ways for that to happen because in part of the omnibus bills that are moving that are becoming just the business as usual, that's made it very challenging for people to already. Um, navigate a complicated system. So what would a session look like? Well, how would your job change if omnibills were a thing of the past? There were a number of bills that could easily have passed. I mean, we've already talked something that I believe had enough support mm -hmm. to pass. But when you get a 900-page bill, or as you act, I think is more than 900 pages, yeah. like three hours ahead of time, I mean, that's a waste of time mm -hmm. and energy. I mean, it's... It took a lot of staff to put that together, and there's no, there's real, the only reason for doing that is because there's a number of poison pills that are in that. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, and again, this would be under the speaker's auspices mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, most of us would not want a big bill, right. because I'd like to have all of these other bills that should have been passed. And we had enough time to get the bills mm -hmm. passed, so I think, I want to make that clear. That last few days, we had, there was extra time okay. while they were putting this huge thing together that we could have done a number mm -hmm. of those bills individually. Uh, and that to me, again, was an incredible disappointment. So because that, that doesn't allow legislators to do their job necessarily, it somewhat diminishes the whole process of the committees throughout the whole session. It eliminates people from having a valid role in the process, so it erodes the public um, trust in a sense in this. But both sides have used omnibus bills, so what can people do, what can legislators do to eliminate that? There's really very few benefits to an omnibus bill that I'm aware of, um, but it's, they continue. You know, in my mind, it's, it's probably a gamble if there are certain bills that you want to get passed. Um, mm -hmm that would be the way to do that. Uh, the one that I think was most striking was in the last year when there was a an employee contract bill with the uh, that was attached to a bill that would take away local control, the preemption mm -hmm. bill. And to put those two things together I thought was definitely wrong. I mean mm -hmm. we as legislators, we are responsible for public employees, mm -hmm. and we should make sure that we handle everything that we're doing with respect for the state employees. Okay. But to, to deliberately put that preemption bill and attach it to a, an employee contract, I thought was just, just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm assuming, uh, and again, that was done uh, with uh, the Republican leadership. Yeah. And so if, if, if at the end of these sessions, I mean, that's clearly not the, not a beneficial process. Um, if 
there was more sunlight, if there was transparency, if these were video recorded, would that help increase transparency? Because with, with increased transparency, you will see more meaningful and involved citizen participation. Um, but when it's done behind closed doors without opportunity for even legislators to be in that room, what are some policies that you might um, support or want to see changed that would improve the transparency at the state level? Well, in the House right now, we do, well, part of the problem is we're not always following the rules anymore, which gets to be the major problem. I mean, we do, mm -hmm. we do vote on uh, rules at the beginning of the session, but the fact is, if something goes wrong, and this is where people don't really understand this, so say I disagree with something mm -hmm. that's happening on the floor, and I can say this is against our rules but it will go up for a vote before the floor. Mm -hmm. So unless the majority of the members are willing to say, yes, this is wrong and we'll do, follow our rules, mm -hmm. if the majority party is not going to back me up, it doesn't make any difference what the rules are. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what you're seeing happening too often. Okay. It's we're not following the rules, we, we are, you know, in. And this could be either party, actually, mm -hmm. it, who's ever in charge. Usually you're not going to go against what your leadership is, is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But the problem I see it is, what is it that's important to the constituents? Yeah. And as I said, there were, there were a number of bills that I, I think we should have easily been able to pass had they made it to a floor vote. Okay, and so should people be asking their representatives, how do you you know, what are you going to do to help increase transparency? Follow right. your rules, come up with new... And that's, and that's what they follow, need. Follow yeah. the and open meeting laws that other levels of government, would that help? Um, and in the House, I do want to mention that, I mean, we do have a 24-hour rule uh, so that the public does have a chance to mm -hmm. look at that. And rarely will you see any changes on the floor of the house. Now, some people look on that as a problem mm -hmm. because if some, if we do see a problem, then it's really diffi very difficult to get an amendment to okay. be passed on the floor because it didn't uh, didn't get a chance for the public mm -hmm. to come forward. Now, the Senate doesn't have that situation. Okay. So it's something to think about. Do you want us to be able to change the bill on the floor, mm -hmm. in which case we need to go back and change that, but uh, I just think it's really important for and for people to maybe watch what we're doing mm -hmm. and to comment to the to both their particular legislator, but also even more important to the leadership. As okay. I said, the speaker, the majority leader, mm -hmm. those are the people that actually have the true power of making things happen. Okay, it's important for people to hear that. Um, you know, and again, bringing people back into the discussion and being part of the process. I think you, I commend you for your, you're an excellent example of how legislators can and should be talking regularly with their constituents. Your town hall meetings, you have always had an open door policy. Anybody should not hesitate to contact you. And in fact, you do that, I know personally, beyond just your own constituency. So it's wonderful that you do that. And yet, even you are running into people who claim um, they're disenfranchised, they're disengaged, they're not going to participate because their voice doesn't matter. Why should I try? What do you say to those folks? Actually, I came across this the other day. There was a young man. Yeah. He's 18. He hadn't registered to vote. Mm. And I asked him why. And he just, again, thought, it doesn't make a difference. And I said, you can't live in Minnesota and tell me your vote doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had so many recounts, you know, for Governor Dayton, for Senator Franken. And when I ran in 2006 in my race, mm -hmm. I won, well, originally it was by 55 votes. And in Minnesota, if it's less than 100, there's a recount. Mm -hmm. That was a long two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I won by 57 votes. Yeah, and so they, that's how important every vote is. Yeah. And, and the fact that they don't think that their interests are being served, that people are not listening to them, that, you know, and, and I take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
certainly I, you know, and I think most of my co colleagues try to respond to people. But, you know, it may be that even if I'm listening, there may be more people that disagree with your position than not. So it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you're always going to get your way. None of us get our way all the time. Right, and sure. supposedly the government that we have, we should be open to compromise. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think our problem is people are not willing to compromise as much as they should. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking their way is is the only way and yeah. I mean we're a really diverse uh, community state country mm -hmm. not all of us can have our own way all the time nor should we I, but we should compromise I think that's an excellent point that nobody's ever going to get their way all of the time but if you participate in the process if you listen to all sides you'll at least understand why decisions sometimes go the way they do but if you don't participate at all then then it's going to be a little trickier to Right. And you need, you need to have your voice, your you, at least you need we to get your comments out there. Yeah. So let me ask you, in addition, addition to listening to your constituencies, which, again, I applaud you because I've, I've seen you in action and you do phenomenal, um, you also have to balance relationship with other locally elected officials. Um, mm -hmm. For example, Dakota County Board, you're on the Dakota County Legislative um, Delegation. Mm -hmm. and. All of the Dakota County state reps and legislators meet on a reg on more than once a year with the Dakota County Board of Commissioners to you often in a workshop setting to discuss the county board's priorities. Now, ironically, most people aren't aware of those discussions. They might not even be aware that the county board has a platform. Um, how do you balance your where where do you um, see your you know, who do you support, your constituents or the board, and especially if these priorities are different. I mean, you get you get introduced to a series of priorities from the county board that may or may not be the same priorities as your constituencies. Who, who should you be servicing? Well, that's where compromise comes in. It rare, rarely is there a, a strong conflict, mm -hmm. and obviously, we both know that there are some issues, particularly having to do with the environment, where uh, it is mm -hmm. really controversial. But uh, as I said, typically, at least right before the se beginning of session and at the end of session, we do a wrap up with the board. And in the last couple of years, what they've tried to do is just uh, to make it easier. They will just have one major issue for mm -hmm. us to concentrate on. Mm -hmm. And so like this year, it was that safety building. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get money for that. Right. Uh, in previous years, they had a few more issues. And how did I put it? I do remember, and we had a number of uh, chairs from Dakota County. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, again, the Republicans were in charge that year. So there are at least, I think, four chairs from Dakota County. So that's a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. And Dakota County got literally nothing. And so you had to hmm. try to figure out how is that possible mm -hmm. that we are one of the largest delegations. We have a number of uh, people from our delegation that are actually chairs of committees, mm -hmm. and yet we couldn't get what Dakota County needed. Right. So it's, it is some, a work in progress okay. all the time. And so, so as you pointed out just this past year, and it's... Um, it's well known that Dakota County's number one priority was the Smart Center. They got that. Now, if you went out and asked your constituents what would have been your number one priority, what if it wasn't that? That's where I'm trying to figure, figure out. out how. What if the number one was the homelessness? It, can you know? How do you balance those two different number one priorities that you hear from constituents and the board, or do you try to take care of both, both. groups? Both. In a sense. Typically, I mean, there's issues like the homeless. I mm -hmm. mean, that one is just ongoing. And obviously, uh, there have been a number of meetings going on within our community trying to address that mm -hmm. also uh, on a larger basis as well. So we're st I'm still going to, we have to do something yeah. about that. I mean, for me to see people standing at intersections mm -hmm. with signs saying that they're homeless, I mean, that is not an acceptable mm -hmm. way. I mean, that's not how I grew up, right. and I certainly don't want us to keep on, keep seeing that. We need to be addressing homelessness, so there is a lot going on on that. Mm -hmm. 
and in that case, yes, we could probably put more pressure. Well, that would be one of the questions, too. Um, does the legislators have significant influence over local elected officials, or do they have more influence on you, or do you feel it's pretty pretty evenly matched there? So that if, if the public wants to really pursue a, a, a priority or something that they feel is most important, they should be contacting both groups. But what if um, you're only hearing... You know, what if they're only talking to you? Do you then go back to the county board and say, you know, I really think you need to look deeper into this? Or is that not? Oh, a I mean, that is definitely what I learned from talking to my constituents. Mm -hmm. I'm going to either bring it forward, okay. either at the meeting or on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That delegation, yeah. Because uh, each one of the commissioners has their own uh, particular mm -hmm. sphere of influence or meetings that they're going to. So mm -hmm. you try to connect with the person that is working on that particular issue. Okay, so you're meeting with your constituents, the local levels of government, and how about the last um, area would be with the Met Council. Um, how, how do you view your relationship with the Met Council? And do you think that they're, you know, that was one of the county board's priorities was to change the governance structure of the Met Council, um, which a lot of people aren't um, aware of the impact and the consequences that that type of thing would have. Um, but where do you see your role? Because uh, are, is the Met Council um, accountable to you, to the citizens, to the governor, all of the above? How do you that's, see your role? That's an incredibly good question. <laughs> because I served on yes. the Egan City Council, Okay, I do have some strong opinions about how the Met Council should, should work. Mm -hmm. And... When, the example would be when I first got on the city council. I went for a couple of years before I ever met with my uh, Met Council representative. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and that's part of the, the issue as well. I mean, when you're trying to put together a policy, because it depends who's in, you know, who that particular person is, how they operate, and how the overall um, Met Council leadership is. Mm -hmm. And... Right now, I think that our Met Council people are just, they are, they are a lot of meetings. Mm -hmm. And I will give them credit that you know, they are trying to be part of the solution. So it's, it's really good. And, uh, but I, as, again, because I remember a situation where it wasn't so good. Mm -hmm. and, and I do believe we need the Met Council for planning. I mean, to, to, when you're talking about sewers, when you're talking about transportation, sure. I mean, that's, there's a lot of communities within our metro area. So I do believe that we need that overall mm -hmm. uh, group to try to keep us together on, on target. Because yeah. we're spending a lot of money to do that. Well, and I believe that it is more efficient, actually, when you do it at a regional level than so many of these issues, you're going to have scales of economy if you're doing it as a region instead of each city or township trying to come up with all the answers. And so, you know, from that standpoint, so uh, what I do th think, and my votes I think will back this up, mm -hmm. is the governor right now is appointing that. And again, it doesn't matter who the governor is. I think because things now were so political that there was a point maybe, maybe when people would have said, okay, the governor can point that, you know, mm -hmm. it's not that uh, controversial, but it is getting controversial. And going back to my days on the Egan City Council, mm -hmm. I believe that it should be the communities that get to appoint their own representative. Okay. Uh, and, and I don't even really think that it has to be an elected official there is one regarding transportation where we, I know yeah. we, ha we need to get the elected officials. Yes. And that's where the TAB board was, right. was working the way it should. And everything I've heard about TAB is it's a, a very smooth running operation. It's exactly. A, it's not the problem. Right. So um, it's, speaking of transportation, you've been on the transportation <laughs> committee for a while. And transportation, yes. um, just uh, several other committees that you sat on relating to transportation, um, What's where do you hit the ground running in January on transportation issues? What are we gonna, what are we gonna see? It's still about doing the long-term funding, and 
we, you know, and actually, I know we've got so much road building going right now that people Oh, yes. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty noticeable in the metro area. Yes, sure. it is. Uh, but again, we live in an area where they can't work all year round, so yeah. when, it, when it is being done, it gets to be very, very complicated. But nevertheless, uh, we are a growing area. And we do need to look at public transit, and we need to be investing in that. In, in Dakota County, now here's where it gets a little tricky. In Dakota County, we don't have any rail right now. Mm -hmm. So all of our money does need to go for roads and bridges because we're using, you know, basically all we have right now is buses for public transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, I would like to see that expanded, but that is, there are, uh, some people in the legislature right now who absolutely will not even discuss rail and have tried to do as much to prohibit ra rail as possible. Okay. And I, again, I'm looking at a comprehensive yes. transportation. And especially, I mean, we're a big ag state. We mm -hmm. use rail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, mm -hmm. I mean, so w there can't be anything that we, we take off the table. I mean, we need to work Again, this is where the local governments come in, is they know what works within their areas. Mm -hmm. So they, again, it's, it's listening to what your local communities are advocating. Okay. Now your, um, your opponent has made a point to state that his biggest priority was gonna be to finish a tax bill for Minnesota. Would you agree that that's a top priority um, if you are find yourself back in that capital in, in January? There is, I mean, we have to get a tax bill out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's no question. Uh, we may be uh, looking at different ways of the, the way the tax bill was, uh, should be. I mean, I, I, you want it to be as easy for people mm -hmm. as possible. And I wish we would have gotten it done earlier. And I do want to mention that our committees can meet even when we're not in session. Okay. Because oh. we, we can have okay. informational right. meetings and and especially for transportation. I mean, you know, we went recently to look at the dig for 35W. Okay. So we, we can take information, we can do trips. What we can't do is actually vote mm -hmm. until we're in session. Okay. So I'm thinking, so you know, the tax the, the tax committee obviously can get some work done after the election so that we are in uh, good shape right at the beginning of the That's session. That's good to hear. Um, we just have a few minutes, a few seconds left. Yeah. What, what final message can you leave our voters with? Um, I just why they think vote for it you. is so important for people to vote. This, you know, I'll go back to uh, Benjamin Franklin. He said, it's a republic if you can keep it. So I just find it really difficult when people tell me that they're not interested or they're not, like there was a man, he's 51 years old, he has never voted. Mm -hmm. I find it hard to understand how we're going to maintain our democracy or a republic yeah. if people don't pay attention to what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good luck to you on November 6th. Thank you I so much. I hope we'll much. see you back here and thank you for watching Access to Democracy. We'll see you next time.